And now for something completely different, fellow time travellers. Uh, as many of you will know, the love letters have just hit the 200 milestone. Uh, we've had millions of downloads so far, which is great fun. Uh, and Paul and I felt that maybe a bit of a breather was in order, a palate cleanser, if you will. Uh, and with that in mind, we decided that we might all enjoy some conversations uh, with some fascinating and inspiring people. And so today, uh, first of those, I'm looking forward to a long free-form chat with someone who in the past couple of years has been a teacher and a guide to me and also a friend. Uh, Will Keat is an expert in the Constitution, which is to say, well, as I understand it, really the long story of how we the people seek to govern ourselves. It's a long story, it's full of history, amongst others, uh, and it's it's a story in, in which it's fair to say there's little in the way of consensus and much in the way of debate, often very heated debate. Uh, on the face of it, and in these oh, febrile times, talk of the Constitution, it might seem esoteric, which is to say, you know, a specialised field of interest that, that, that might seem of interest only to the few rather than the many. And I certainly used to think that talk of the Constitution was right out there on the fringe. It was off my radar. But with Will's help, I've come to understand that contemplating how we as people should govern ourselves goes to the heart of everything else that's happening around us. Not just here in the UK, but everywhere and for everyone. So, so with that as a as a, a an introduction to the idea, let's get down to it. Good morning, Will Keat. How are you? I'm very well, Neil. It's it's great to be on, and good to see you. Fantastic, and uh, hello to all your viewers. I want to make the most of the time, so I'm going to get right into it. First of all, Will, what do you make of the situation in which we find ourselves? By which I mean what feels like a steady drift uh, to what I consider to be totalitarianism. You're ruled by a dictatorial cacistocracy. How, what, how, is, how is all of that making you feel in your skin? Um, pretty uneasy. <laughs> As I'm sure it does with most people, it's um, it's it's very frustrating. Um, and uh, I I've, I suppose you you know and thank you for that very kind introduction. Um, I've spent quite a lot of time looking at, at not only the British and uh, the English Constitution as it was, um, but also quite a lot of the as you said you used the word esoteric. You've got to be careful with that one. <laughs> um, but quite a lot of that foundational material that sits behind the Constitution. Um, which is about uh, much deeper um, aspects to this. Um, and it gets into philosophy, it gets into our uh, required ideology, um, it gets us into all kinds of, of, of much deeper subjects that many people are not really prepared to go. It feels a bit uncomfortable to uh, many people in society at the moment to go that deep. Um, but actually, I think we're required to do so. I think I think we've got out of the habit of getting th in, into subjects deeply um, and addressing things that are profound and important. Um, and um, I feel strongly about that. And I don't think people are getting their heads around some of these things. And so I've, I, I suppose, and, and thank you for calling me a teacher, because I, I regard myself as an aggregator of information. Um, I've never really been a deep researcher, actually. Um, I've never been a natural academic. Um, my reading is good, but it's not that fast. Um, and I assimilate information quite well and quite easily. Um, but like a lot of people, I like it in small packaged forms. And then I can start to form the dots and start putting the picture together, if you like. And, and I like ass assisting others to do the same. So my primary exercise in this is to, is to look at some of these deepest topics and these deepest subjects. Uh, and to start forming some layers that are easier to assimilate and easier to understand and help people form form the you know put the dots together and and form the picture and make it a bit clearer so uh, yeah it, 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 i think you know you as i said in 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 introducing you you know we've we've spoken about this and it i cannot express too strongly what a 
revelation it was for me. Because on the one hand, you know, you say the word constitution and it, it can sound a bit dry, you know, maybe yeah. the stuff of, of, of legal minds or something. But yeah. nonetheless, something that you don't think really applies to you. Right. But th- at some point in one of our conversations, there was this, uh, well, obviously, like I would have to say that a light went on w- over my head. And it, it made me think in the, all in an instant about, it, it, in the C.S. Lewis Narnia books, there's the talk about the, uh, there's the, there's the, the ice queen who's powerful, but she is but beneath her or above her, there's older magic mm-hmm. that she has no control over right. and that is that, that wields power over her. Yes. And it, it, it was that sense in which I suddenly realized that rather than being something dusty and, you know, desiccated, that an understanding of the way in which we relate to each other and to authority. Yes. It, it goes right to the foundations of what we are as human beings. Completely. Yeah. And so with that, how did you get into, how did you get into this will? I mean, I've, I've said it was really by chance. It was really by encountering you that I became aware of this material, but what was your process? Yeah, I mean, my my process really was, I, I suppose I sort of um, <clears throat> woke up, if you like, to to the reality um, uh, that, that we live in a largely conspiratorial reality um, and that what the information that we learn through the mainstream channels of information, through schools and universities and so on, some of it's great, but some quite foundational uh, stories that we, or narratives that we put put out there, which are which serve as the basis for some other quite um, quite big edifices above it um, are pretty problematic. Actually, there are some some quite concerning things, and I, I spotted this in about two thousand and six. Um, and uh, but again, like a lot of people, with discovering things that that there's there's big systemic corruption behind the scenes, and there are there are, there are people in positions of power that that probably shouldn't be. Um, I, I, I sort of discovered that a lot of this was symptoms, actually, um, symptoms of something much deeper. Um, and I think that the problem at the moment with the whole world of, of um, sort of conspiracy theorizing and, and all the rest of it, it's a real thing. There's no question that some of this is going on. Absolutely. And it's really important to come to terms with that and to um, expose some of that in your own mind and understand how that's happened, and how that's worked. But it doesn't stop there. So I'm um, I'm firmly of the belief that a true awakening doesn't really come from just exposing more and more conspiracy. You know, once you once you know that that this stuff exists and it's in pretty large scale as well, um, you don't need to keep searching for more. You know, there's, frankly, there's enough when you come across some big ones. You know, and and you know that that can't exist in isolation as well. Logically, it can't. So, so you realize that the, there's something much bigger at play here. I then decided, well, I need to look at the cause of this. Um, and the cause to me was, was really about governance. Because if, you're, if you're, um, your community and how it's governed um, is, is, is less than good standard and there, there are things seriously going wrong and we're losing our latitude within society and we're losing our freedoms, that we need to explore that and find out, well, is there anything that sort of establishes how that should function, how it should work? And, of course, that naturally led me to constitutional law because really the purpose of a constitution, um, I suppose, is to, for your nation, and I'm talking about a constitution not of a business or anything else or an association or whatever, I'm talking about a constitution of a nation. Um, And what that's there for is to set up the, the absolutely... Um, broad brush principles of how governance is supposed to operate. And it will de- determine things like the relationship between the citizenry, the people, the populace, um, and any administrative government that there might be there, or maybe even determine the fact that there shouldn't be a government at all. Um, heaven forbid, let's even suggest that, you know. So that's what I started to do because I'd heard great things about the about the British Constitution and the English Constitution, how it was uh, it fought for the people's liberties and the and, and all of this, you know, um, some wonderful lofty ideas that were being claimed. And I thought, well, if it's so lofty and it's so wonderful, and we like to celebrate it, then what the hell is going on? 
uh, it's either just not functioning or something's gone, taken a horrible turn. So that's what I was doing. I started to look into that. And, um, and, and yeah, and we can get into that and wh- where I, I unearthed, if you like, some aspects of the British Constitution that are very deeply concealed, very hidden. Uh, I suspect by some quite deliberately, or they're quite happy at least that those things are quite hidden. Um, but I've been surprised since then that those that like to fight for freedom and are very concerned about their, their lack of freedoms don't focus on this. And yet, really, this is actually the central issue. It's the central cause. It's all about governance. It's about justice. It's about law and order and the rule of law. Can you take us back then to to the fundamentals? You know, we, we talk about, the, well, you're talking about the English Constitution or, or the British Constitution. Is there a, a simple way in which you can express what it is and what it's supposed to to do for us and sure. then yeah following on from that what what about that is being hidden as you suggest what is being kept from us and why yes and it's it's quite complicated i mean let's just just take it sort of step at a time we'll talk about the fundamentals so um to me the purpose of a a constitution at least the um a legitimate constitution that fights for the freedoms of the people of that nation because any other constitution by definition is illegitimate because if the people are not are not being um, given an authority if you like over um, over over their own government uh, I've already given it away essentially um, that's the key relationship isn't it you know who who's the final arbiter of law if you like uh, who has the ultimate authority so either you have a constitution that successfully elevates the people in authority over their own government. Um, to the extent, perhaps, as I've already suggested, that the government isn't actually meant to be a government at all and is merely meant to be an administration, which is why anarchists need to jump on board. And we'll get into that later. Tricky word, anarchy, but we'll get onto that maybe a little bit later on. Yeah, so either it does that or it's the other way round, in which case you're in big trouble, because even if you've got a, a relatively benign government to start with, um, ultimately, if it has the ultimate power, then you've always got a problem. You're always, the trajectory is always going to be towards tyranny of some sort. Yeah. So, which is why I always ask the question, can government do anything it likes? Yeah. Or more importantly, can government do anything it likes legitimately? <laughs> All right. So, cause, cause at the moment right now, it's quite obvious that they can do anything they like. Um, and, and, th- and they do, you know, um, all the time, as we know. Um, but but the key word at the end is legitimately. Yeah, is is there something about um, our constitution that provides lawful limitations on our own government? Um, and that's the key question. Yeah. So anyway, just 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 to cut a long story short, I ended up reading um, probably one of the most important essays uh, on this subject um, by a gentleman called Lysander Spooner, who was an American lawyer. This was an essay he wrote in 1852, um, and you can find it on on the web on my my website, one of my websites that I look after, which I, I'll uh, we'll go. With, I'll mention those later what they are, um, but it's in the resources section, um, and it's it's his his essay trial by jury on trial by jury 1852, um, but he says this. I'll just quote it. Actually, I've just written it down because it's quite important. The authority to judge what are the powers of the government and what are the liberties of the people must necessarily be vested in one or other of the parties themselves, the government or the people, because there is no third party to whom it can be entrusted. If the authority be vested in the government, the government is absolute and the people have no liberties except such as the government sees fit to indulge them with. If on the other hand, the power be vested in the people, then the people have all liberties, as against the government, except such as substantially the whole people, through a jury, there's the clue, choose to disclaim. And the government can exercise no power, except such as substantially the whole people, through a jury, consent that it may exercise. <laughs> so that, there's the clue from Lysander Spooner, that ultimately what you're really after, what you're really wanting, is a common law constitution. Okay, that's a constitution that's based on common law. 
Um, and, and that is and an example of that is the English Constitution. So the, in, the, the specifically the English strain of law that came from prior to the Norman invasion is really where our um, our common law comes from. And that's essentially the principle that favours the liberties of the people and the fact that the people themselves must be taking part in the process of creating their own law or deciding on the moral character of the community in which they wish to live. It's not down to a special few, was there, it's down to the people themselves. Was there ever a time when, uh, uh, in terms of the common law, the people had the kind of... Uh, freedom that you're talking about you, was it ever was that was that a uh, golden age ever experienced by any generations of people i think to some extent yes uh and it, and of course all through history it's gone up and down and we've we, we've had a um a, you know an oscillation if you like of of greater liberty um and then pressures against that uh, a resistance so there's always been this tussle um and, and essentially, uh, in the history of, of our English constitution, that specifically boils down to the tussle between common law uh, and, a, and an authoritarian government, a collectivist state, essentially, which we should get into because the, the two ideologies of individualism and collectivism is absolutely key because those are the foundational principles. Um, so there is a kind of, and we'll get onto this, but there, there's a kind of inevitability as I call, as I call it, that the system cannot actually operate any other way, which is quite exciting in some ways. That, and, and what do I mean? That I mean, I mean by that that the universe uh, requires of us certain conditions or certain things to be in place for us to be able to put together a community or society that broadly contains liberty. There are certain conditions for that to be in place, prerequisites, if you like. And, and that's where it becomes quite esoteric because that's where we start to get into the subject of natural justice and understanding individual rights. Are <laughs> so, you saying, Will, that the universe wants us to be free? Correct. Requires us to be free? Yes, absolutely. So, so and, and often I, I throw the term, the title of the, of, of the subject, natural law, um, around and uh, I expect people to know a little bit about what that means and I always get people just nodding firmly and saying yes I, I know what that means and actually I know quite often that you don't really do you actually but the study of natural law is absolutely critical and it's one of the most hidden topics on the planet and it's it, it sits at the center of the occulted body of knowledge uh, the what we call the occult yeah, and um, people get very hot under the collar at that point because they'll go, no, this is all really evil knowledge and you shouldn't go anywhere near that. Well, that was that's quite a good mind game they played on you. It's quite deliberately done like that to make sure that you don't look at it. Um, but yes, the occult body of knowledge, which is, was broadly held by the ancient mystery traditions, is an absolutely critical understanding of this because it allows people to become firm in their ideology and their principles. They, that they can have working principles for their life at a moral level, at a deeply moral level, that is in alignment with the way the universe functions, actually, the way that it actually wants us to live. So there is an intelligent system. It's quite scientific, actually. It's often known as the esoteric sciences. By reading how the universe actually works and how it functions, and that takes us into hermeticism and all kinds of things, which we won't need to go into now, but what you can glean from that is that, that certain behaviors and certain um, patterns that you might try to lay down within your society will cause you karmic consequence, negative consequence, or positive karmic consequence, depending on what those are. Okay, And what that's really defining is the boundaries of what's okay and what isn't as far as the universe is concerned. Does that mean that is, is, is it is it is it a bit like uh, you know uh, magnetic north pulls the needle on a compass? Right. That's, yes. that's where the that's where the that's where the needle wants to go. Yes, and that you can get in the way of that. You could put your finger on the needle and stop it aligning with north, but it's but it's not where the needle wants to be. 
Yes. So that's exactly it. So, so what, what you're saying is, is we're, we're getting into the, in a, in a way, I suppose, into the propensity for humans to gaslight themselves and to lie to themselves a, an awful lot. Okay. So much more than people would realize because most of our conscious behavior is actually quite a small amount. We actually, um, behave and we're getting into human psychology here. Um, might be getting into stuff that's a bit too deep at this point, but you know we'll, we'll run with it for the moment. Um, the fact of the matter is that a lot of us as humans um, are, are, are acting from a place of subconscious um, or, or unconscious behavior a lot of the time, which means we're not aware that we're doing it. Um, and this is to do with, in esoteric terms, to do with the thoughts, feelings, and actions, the three, the three pillars of consciousness. If what you think and what you uh, feel about it and what you do is are not in alignment and not in alignment with natural law you're going to bring all kinds of stuff upon yourself and that's not because it's meant to be punishment as such it's meant to be clear definitions or that, that are delivered back through dynamics within the universe to give us opportunities to learn lessons of how we should evolve how we should become conscious yeah, it's it's really quite absolute. So what we're really getting down to, I suppose, is saying that morality is absolute. There is an absolute morality that's written into the universe, not from a religious perspective, not because we, we want to worship some deity. It's not that. I mean, yes, there is an intelligent universe, of course, um, but it's written into the universe in the form of dynamics that if you go against that and you're in conflict with nature, you're going to bring about self-destructive patterns within your community and within your own life. And that's what we mean by negative karmic consequence, essentially. It's like a mirror that's held up to you, that if you engage in certain behaviors, you're just going to get flack back because the universe doesn't operate like that, right? And so going back to, to the way that this should operate, a lot of people sort of like boil this down, common law, they boil it down to um, something quite straightforward, which is, um, that we're, we're supposed to operate in, in honor with integrity uh, and not take things from other people. A, a bit like the Ten Commandments. Like the Ten Commandments, absolutely. You can express it uh, in an intellectual sense um, quite straightforwardly because it's quite easy to break it down to that. But actually when it comes to doing it in reality, it's much more difficult than people realize because of this unconscious behavior that we exhibit. Um, and this is to do with getting into ourselves uh, and, re and self-reflecting and doing our shadow work. Um, and we start to operate from places of prejudice, traumas. We react because of tra uh, past traumas and we go into denial about things. There's all kinds of behaviors that we exhibit that we don't even spot, that we don't even know about. And, and is it the case, Will, then, that the, those who sought to frame uh, the 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 English Constitution were in touch were were more in touch with all that you've just been describing. Yes, the way that the universe wanted to be, natural law. Yes, uh, do do we see enshrined in the, let's say the English Constitution uh, people who were more in line with the universe? Yes. Um, now you could, on the one hand, say that that was a. a a, um, a, a lucky coincidence that thank goodness some events came together within um, about 1215, which was when the Great Charter, Magna Carta, was put together. Um, and the two, two years or so leading up to that point was quite interesting and quite complex. But, but the, broadly, what we can spot is that those who were behind the 1215 Great Charter, um, in, in particular, the Archbishop Stephen Langton, had quite a um, a recognition, if you like, of natural justice. He understood that morality really came from nature, uh, and that actually, um, you know, what is what is morally good uh, is actually um, going to result in abundance and health. And yeah, so so if you can discover well, what makes a human being healthy, what makes his his attitude. Um, somebody who's got great energy and, and verve and, um, and, and what that is, is somebody who is true to their purpose, their sense of purpose and has the freedom to, to find that purpose um, and is content in their lives. So, so law needs to be based on that principle, essentially.
And what you're really coming back to is is a is an ideology of of individual rights. Your community needs to respect each other's individual rights because we want a society that's equitable. That means that it, we are all equal before the law. It's very difficult in the first point for anyone to argue against that. So you get to that first sort of logical place of argument where you say, do, are we actually all equal before the law? Do we want that? Is that right? There are very few in society that will attempt to argue against that one. There will be some, I think, as we know. But generally speaking, most sensible people will understand that, no, we have to respect each other's free will, which is what that ultimately translates into. So that's the idea that my my rights end where yours begin. Yes. OK, so that that sense of respecting each other's individual rights is absolutely key. And what we're getting down to here, beginning to see, um, is the ideology of individualism as opposed to collectivism, which is this idea that the group has authority over you naturally. And that's not the case. That's a deeply um, destructive ideology that will ultimately result in a society spiraling downwards into absolute oblivion. And that's where we're heading at the moment, by the way, because we're essentially collectivist. Yeah. But if we can return, and that means if the people themselves can start to understand what it is to be an individualist, that's respecting each other's individual rights. It's, for example, it's, um, you know, it's uh, free speech has come up for, for you in Scotland at the moment in quite a big way. Um, it's an individualist would understand that and fight for the right of the person that I disagree with fundamentally also to be able to express what they think and believe. Yeah, and that's that's the, an example of an individualist in how they think. Yeah. And, and, and so that's absolutely key and at the heart of the English Constitution. The, it's the people in an equitable society that take part in the formation of the moral character and the laws of their community. In what way was that high ideal, were those high ideals enshrined in, for example, the Great Charter, Magna Carta? What's there in Magna Carta that we've lost? Because people always say to me, yeah, yeah, Magna Carta's been superseded by and it's out of date and it's all been blah, 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 blah. What was there in Magna Carta that's sure. so important that we've lost now? So Magna Carta 1215, the original Great Charter, um, which, by the way, is not legislation. They can't repeal it. They might claim they can, <laughs> um, but they can't. It's not legislation. Um, it's customary law. What is it then? Cu customary law. So it's, it's known as legem terry or lex terry, um, which is the law of the land. The original definition of the law of the land, which came from the English uh, the English strain of law that comes from the Saxon, the late Saxon kings and earlier and much earlier, too. Um, but not only, actually. In fact, most of Europe was functioning under common law as well. So common law principles were, were extant all over Europe, generally, actually. Um, but just to answer your, your question specifically, there are a number of, of chapters of the 1215 Magna Carta, a subset that are regarded, they're known as the Articles of Common Law. That's where your common law is. So when people talk about common law, an awful lot of rubbish is being talked about common law, actually. But what you, what you should be doing if you're talking about common law is calling it constitutional law. OK, so because that's what it is, really. Constitutional law is common law. Um, and the Articles of Common Law that exist within Magna Carta is a subset but the most important being Article 39 and Article 40. There are others, too. Let's focus on those uh, during this. And, and Article 39 in particular um, is really important because that's what's giving us the right to a jury of our social equals so that when we are judged, we can't receive punishment without the judgment of a court of conscience. That's what it's basically saying. But interestingly, about 200 years before 1215 Magna Carta, that same principle was expressed in, in other places at other times, but in particular by Emperor Conrad himself, um, a Roman Catholic as well, interestingly, 
um, where he said, no, no one shall lose his estate unless according to the custom of our ancestors and the judgment of his peers and the judgment of his peers. Same principle, 200 years earlier than Magna Carta. So this was going on way before. And you've also got, you know, um, the history of, of Alfred the Great uh, in the late 1800s uh, hanging judges for going against um, the the jury, the decision of the jury. <laughs> so, so this idea, so not only have we got trial by jury established as a principle, but the most important principle, um, which is that the jury must have the power and the right to disagree with any legislation from government, if you do have a government at all, right? So any legislation that might be in place can be, a, can be disagreed with. Is that still is that still the case? Because we've certainly come to a point now where you know you've got majority verdicts in in juries, and I think most people would would think that a, where a jury exists at all, uh, it's just to come to a majority verdict about whether or not someone did yep. something. Yes, that, that, they, is, they... is it still the case that the jury can say, "But wait a minute, this this legislation itself is is nonsense." Yes. Yes, it's still happening. Every now and again, you're still going to get a case of annulment. It's still going on. And if anybody's interested, it's worth watching um, a very interesting documentary um, made by a channel in America in 1986. And it's on the resources section, again, uh, of, of my first website, commonlawconstitution.org. In the resources section, there's a documentary an hour long, which you should, all of you should watch it. Compulsory viewing. You should watch it. It's very moving. In, and quite amazing to watch, actually. But that is a documentary made in America. You wouldn't be able to do it over here, where they go into a, a real case in America um, where and, and they go into to the jury and into the deliberations of the jury. They actually film it. Um, and it, they, you, you can see all of this. They're, they're going through this and, and, and grappling with, with whether they think they have the right to disagree with the legislation or not, it absolutely specifically comes up. And the judge won't tell them in court because he doesn't want to do it. Because one of the key things about the, your, your right as a juror to disagree with the current legislation, with any, any legislation that comes before the court, um, they don't want you to know that. You know, that's very much hidden. Um, but it actually is down to the defense lawyer that tells the jury specifically that they do have this power and right to do so. And they go away and talk about it. Is this right that we should do this and all this? And they come to the conclusion that they must, in this case, do that. And they pass a not guilty verdict as a result. And then just to give you an indication of the gaslighting that's going on in the establishment, the judge that has, has not wanted to tell them of their right to do this stands up at the end and congratulates them for doing so <laughs> and, and actually gives a little speech about how important this principle is. Um, now, okay, he might have known he was on camera because it was a documentary that was being made, but this is the kind of thing, and, and we're jumping ahead a little bit, but actually we're getting onto it, um, which is to do with this um, concept of the gaslighting and the double think that's going on in the establishment, because that's what I think it really is. You know, is it really a case of people behind the scenes with kind of white cats sitting on their knees, kind of um, rubbing their hands with glee and, and, and we're taking more liberty from the people, you know, kind of thing? No, I don't think it is. I think it might be with a few who are capitalizing on that, possibly. But I also think that most of those within the establishment um, are fearful because they, they, they think and they believe that if we made it official and we made it an official thing that the people know that they have this right to do so. And this is quite, this is the ironic statement that you actually see sometimes written down in academic writing. We would have anarchy. <laughs> well, funnily enough, yes, you would. And that's, that's actually possibly how it's supposed to be. But anyway, I mean, we can get is it, is it, is it, is it in essence? Well, is it the? Is it uh, to express? I suppose in the most benign terms, is it a steady development of a paternalistic attitude to the people? Yes. By 
by by those who seek and obtain power. Yes, by collectivism. They basically just think that the, 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 the mass of the population are too stupid to take advantage of these ancient freedoms. Right. That so is we'll, a, just I, inv- we'll just invite them to not know yes. they have these freedoms because for God's sake, if they start exercising these freedoms, who oh, knows what they want to do? Right. And the problem is, is that they might be right. Because the suggestion that you could make at that point is that actually, are we ready and responsible enough and trustworthy enough to step into that role, right? So what this is ultimately about is a vicious cycle. Okay, so the the more you give your rights away and the more you outsource portions of your life to a government or whatever it may be to take on that, the, the, the less latitude you have because you're not taking responsibility. You're not trustworthy anymore to self-govern, right? So the more that you do that, the more, and this is a law of, of, this is one of the dynamics within natural law, is that the less responsibility that you you have and the less trustworthy you are, the more that, that that space has to then be filled by a government in the form of legislation, which is really order following. That's essentially what it is. If you have a justice system, that is largely based on following orders, which is really what legislation is. Yeah, Yeah, it's not really getting to the bottom of, um, you know, your conscience and understanding the context and what we call in Latin mens rea, which is the state of mind of the individual when he supposedly committed that crime. If you're not doing that in a court of conscience, in a a trial by jury-like process, and you're simply dishing out punishment on the basis of rather crass, preconceived legislation. That is the sign of a deteriorating society because it's a society that's not take where the individuals within society are no longer able to take personal responsibility for managing themselves. That's a sign of where we're going. Okay. So that's a natural dynamic of natural law that, that the, if you don't want, if you want to, if, if, if you want a society that's safe, then you're going to lose your liberty. You can't have both. If you want liberty, then there comes with it risk. And that includes risk of offense in, in, in speaking your mind. It comes with dangers potentially, right? But if you don't, so, so the people in, in, in the establishment and the political class, if you like, come from that mindset, as do a lot of people in society, by the way, because they're only a reflection of us more broadly, they have a mindset of fear. So they're in fear, which means that they want to be more controlling to prevent things from going wrong, okay? The more in fear that you are and the more controlling you become, the less liberty that you have, obviously, right? So when you think about it in these terms, you can see how these natural dynamics are starting to play out. And that's where we are right now. And we're going downwards. And the reason why we continue to go downwards is because the people generally within society do not exercise their minds in the subjects of individual rights, consciousness, um, the illegitimacy of the authority of government, uh, self-responsibility, trustworthiness. Where does morality come from? Right. These are all the big topics which I'm fascinated by. And other people are less fascinated by, seemingly, <laughs> except you, Neil. Um, but but this is where we are charged. We are charged as as a people, as as human beings in our evolution, to find this stuff not only interesting but bloody important and profound. And when we don't, we get the flack. We get the negative consequences back for it, and that's what we've got. It, it makes me think, what you're saying makes me think of a couple of simple things, really. First of all, I don't know who said it, but it has been said, and it is true that people get the government that they deserve. Right, exactly, yeah. yeah. You know, so, so, you know, if, if, we, can't, if we can't or won't or, or, or aren't in, uh, educated or, or whatever, sensitive enough to look after ourselves, then we're, we're yes. going to inherit governments that will do it for us. And the, yeah. and the other one that you make me think of is the, uh, in the, 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 the movie, um, uh, uh, Twelve Angry Men. A few men. good men. Yeah. No, Twelve I think a few men. good men. Oh, ja- good when Jack men. Nicholson and his yes. and his and his temper says, "You can't handle the truth." You can't handle the truth. Yeah. 
Perfect. Yeah, which, a- and per- perhaps we can't. I'm afraid that is true. Broadly speaking, if you look at the psychology of humanity generally, the state of consciousness at the moment is that we're always making up a version of reality for ourselves. We do it to ourselves. We lie to ourselves a lot of the time, much more than we would like to admit, actually. This is some of the things that I get into um, in much more depth in my, in my courses. But we, you know, we begin to discover some quite shocking things that the more the, the, the nicer you are, you know, you, people talk about the nicest people in society actually are the most dangerous because they're not authentic, right? They're often people pleasers. You know, if you're going around pleasing people and just saying the thing that you think you should say, that's a really evil thing to do, by the way. You shouldn't be doing that because you're not being honest and you're not acting with integrity. You're not being authentic, right? So what the universe wants for us is to be honest and authentic, not to be nice. That's a different thing, right? That's being safe again. It's actually being honest. And that means, by the way, and this is a really key point, is that if you sit on the sideline when you recognize evil is going on and you think and you're happy for that to be brushed under the carpet during that meeting or whatever it is, and you don't say something, you are going to get negative consequence out of that. Always. It will always come back to bite you in some way. Yeah. And that's what natural law is. Don't sit on the sideline. You, it does not go down well for you if you do that kind of thing. You have to speak up in defense of truth. So I'm standing this, like I'm this, ranting all the time. I'm sorry. It's no, 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 this, this goes, this, well, this will, this goes to the heart of why I find this so compelling and fascinating and revelatory. Yes. Because you know, you, you come into a subject like this, perhaps uh, expecting that, well, as soon as I understand it, you know, everything will be better and, you know, and we'll be able to fix society and it will be more, you know, equitable and, and fair and all, all of the rest of it, which may or may not be the case. But I find this fascinating because I by, by just beginning to, uh, to uh, inch closer to putting my, my hand on the third rail of the universe, I, I know that at, at least I'll understand. Even if I even if I can't change anything, yes. Even if I can't make the world around me better, yes. It will be enough almost to go to my grave, having momentarily understood. Right. Yeah. The the, the 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 universe that the universe itself has our best interests at heart. Yes, and that if we would just align ourselves like the like the needle on the compass with what the what the universe knows is best for us, totally then right. it would be all right. And that's enough for me. Yes, I mean, I mean, you're right. It's you know that's a that's a really exciting point that one gets to when you begin to realise that no, actually, you know that that the, there is a an intelligence and and a divine aspect of the universe that is actually willing us to to self-improve, yeah, and to become healthy. Freedom is the expression of health in 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 the universe broadly. That 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 is what it's wanting, okay. And that means expansion. It means expansion of the mind. Uh, it means expansion of ideas. It doesn't mean closing things down and shutting things down. So this recent law up in Scotland that you, you had to deal with and notice that you're not in prison, Neil. That's excellent. I'm very pleased to see that. So far. <laughs> um, it, it is, it is made by, these kind of laws are made by people who really have no responsibility, no sense of responsibility. They don't understand. They're actually very limited. And I'm sorry, but if that sounds very arrogant, but actually they're dangerous people uh, they're actually very spiritually immature as well. Um, and I'm just going to say it because, because that, you know, I can back that up. Um, people like that are acting from a, pl- a place of fear. Um, and just, just to clarify this whole business of individualism and collectivism, a collectivist thinks that they know everything there is to know, which is, which is in a sense where their desire to impose something upon you with no questions and no debate, where that comes from. The difference with an individualist is that you know how much you don't know, okay? And so contained within that is the idea that 
I have a natural humility um, and, and a carefulness here. And that's where an individualist will come from. It's not that they won't want to engage in collectivist behavior. Collectivism is at a later stage. Collectivism is where you start with the idea that the, that, that the group has authority. And that's really dangerous. But an individualist, first of all, recognizes the fact that my rights end where someone else's begin, to use that phrase again. Yeah. And that makes them much safer. What, what you've done to me, Will, over the last couple of years is you've made me, uh, against all my expectations, you know, compared to the rest of my life, very, very wary of what we've been taught is democracy, which is right. to say that the majority governs. You've made me very. There's a lot of conversations that I'm that I listen to at the moment, and indeed take part in about direct democracy. You know, which is to say, having a referendum about this, that, and the next thing. Yeah. Which on the face, you know, based on the on the Swiss system, you know, where you have, you know, you, they have referenda about everything. What yeah. colour should the traffic yeah. lights be? You know, yeah. what you know, how wide should the pavements be? Yeah. Whatever. And th there's an assumption built into that that if you've got 100 people and 51 people decide one way and 49 people decide the other way that, that implicitly the 51 are right yeah. just because they are the majority. But you've frightened the living daylights out of me because you've, you've made me come to terms with the fact that actually that kind of collectivist majority-based decision-making is terribly, terribly dangerous because my own experience in the last four years around things like mandated medical interventions, lockdown, lockdowns yeah. and so on. Yeah. I, I, I bet my mortgage that had there been a uh, referenda about those at the time would have been locked down and welded into our homes and we would have been held down in the street and injected with things. Oh, absolutely. Because totally. that, yeah. that's what the majority would have yes. wanted. And it's, it, it, you frightened me into the understanding that it's the, <laughs> that it's, that it's the, it's the stubborn minority that yes. are prepared to not be nice. Correct. And exactly. to say no yes. and to be awkward bastards that actually are, you know, hold in their hands the salvation of humanity. Right. No, no, you're absolutely right. And it often takes the, the minority to see the truth in something. Um, why is that often? Because because the, the majority are often a bit lazy in arriving at their conclusion anyway. Um, and, and sometimes it's also a bit difficult to, to face the truth. Truth is sometimes not very comfortable to face. And, it, and, and therefore, it's only the minority that actually faces it. There are all kinds of reasons why it's quite often the case that the majority aren't right at all. And, and so, so to have a political system, and, and by the way, that isn't democracy. You know, we've been led to believe that democracy is all about voting in elections. It's not. That's not what it is. OK, so, well, it, it, it's a minor characteristic of democracy, and it's really only about bringing somebody into office. So you do need to have voting for that. The problem, what they've done is they've conflated two things. They've, they've conflated a package of measures or policy along with the prime minister that you're bringing into office, right? So, so actually, you're doing a whole load of things at the same time that were never designed to be done. Yeah, the political system, which came about in the late 1600s, early 1700s, um, is not really what democracy is anymore. That's suffrage, adult suffrage. Yeah, and true democracy, actually, its main characteristic is about placing a mechanism into your system that puts the people as the final arbiter of law, as the deciders of justice, okay? And it comes from exousia rights in, in, in the ancient Athenian constitution. That's where it began. Uh, but there's a whole history of that. But really, that's what democracy is. And we've had a mind game done on us about that, really, which is why it's really important that people who know this and are listening to this now correct people at every opportunity. Yeah, that democracy, because even even in the freedom fighting campaign groups, you know, they get this wrong. Oh, we don't want democracy. Well, I know what you mean. But actually, democracy, when you understand what it properly is, is actually closer to, to anarchism, <laughs> which, which is self mastery, taking responsibility and being trustworthy. Right. That's really what democracy is. The difference, actually, with between anarchy and democracy is that. A, a, a democracy allows the people to lead an anarchist lifestyle within a, a relatively safe container of the nation and the constitution, right? 
That that's the difference. Um, and it's a subtle difference, but it's an important one. And and Anakin- well, as you said, but as you said, as you said, as long as people hold true to the notion that that my rights end where your rights begin. Right, exactly it, yes. If and, everyone if everyone operated along those lines, then the inherent dangers in the system would be would be controlled. Yes, it's it, it's not a magic solution. You've you've got to work for this. You know, this is the this is the point. This is people need to hold this in their hearts and to understand those principles. Yeah, you don't just get to have a free society just by being kind of casual about life and it doesn't work like that. Right. So, um, I mean, in fact, I'll just, I'll just read this little quotation from Lysander Spooner again, actually. The conclusion, therefore, is that any government that can for a day enforce its own laws without appealing to the people or to a tribunal fairly representing the people for their consent. See, that's where the consent of the governed actually comes from. It's the tribunal. It's the, it's the trial by jury. Is in theory an absolute government. A government irresponsible to the people and can perpetuate its power at pleasure. The trial by jury is based upon a recognition of this principle and therefore forbids the government to execute any of its laws by punishing violators in any case whatsoever, without first getting to the consent, getting the consent of the country or the people through a jury. In this way, the people at all times hold their liberties in their own hands and never surrender them, even for a moment, into the hands of the government. Yeah, you, I mean, you, you just can't it's, put it better than him. I mean, it's just brilliant. This it's, stuff, it's, it's, all, it's awe-inspiring. If one, once you begin even to, even to glimpse yes. what is... The, the 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 power of what you've just said, you know, the, the idea that a person comes before a jury of of similar people, you know, pe- pe- people that are like him or her, have, have similar life experiences, and the the administration, the government, or the judiciary, whatever, is a, it says that this person may have done something wrong, yeah, and you've got to decide if, if for a moment people r- remembered. Or, or, or invited themselves to relearn that it's not just about deciding based on the legislation whether or not that person did the crime or didn't do the crime. Even more important is deciding if that legislation has any business being right. part of the law of the land. That, that's exactly it. And if, I- it, if it, and if it doesn't, the, the, but the very idea that, that 12 whatever men and women in England or 15 in Scotland hold that power, that, that a, legis- a bill that's gone through that agonising process, through the Commons, through Parliament, Royal Assent, there it is in the statute books, that 12 people from a, you know, from a, from a, from a working class background sat in a jury can actually say, do you know what? No. Yeah. We're not having that. Yes. Not only is this person innocent, yeah. but, but that legislation... Is not fit for purpose. That is awesome power. That is, yeah, that that is essentially what they're saying. It's important to keep in mind that a, a case of annulment by jury happens only in that one case. So for that case alone, you're basically saying in this specific situation, that piece of legislation is is as you say not fit for purpose. Okay. Now, if you were to get continuous anu- cases of annulment of a piece of legislation, there are further more protracted processes where you can go after. Because under the constitution, you can privately prosecute um, any any public servant because they have no liability protection, um, which means that that anyone who's been involved in passing legislation that is, um, that is deemed to be uh, unlawful under the constitution, that's quite a threat. You need to bring that before yeah. a trial by jury, and then you've got a problem because then that piece of legislation is before the court, and then and then you're into actually expunging that that piece of legislation entirely from the statute book. So, yeah, there are all these mechanisms in place. And the other aspect, you know, that I've acquired from you over the last couple of years is it's awesome responsibility that you're describing. You know, you, you, that you're invited to ask of yourself, am I worthy of this? Do, do I, am I, in, am I in alignment with the universe? Am I a, am I a fit soul to sit in this kind of judgment, like Solomon of old, 
Yes, it o- brings o- own in- society and own people. You think, oh my, I don't know if I'm ready for this. It's, it- it, make, it makes you question your very being. Yes, it bring, it, yeah. you're absolutely right. It brings in the humility and the right energetic. Yeah, it, because it's mm-hmm. profound, this. If you get asked to be on a jury, that's, that, that is prestigious, right? That is, should be the most exciting thing in our community that you get to do because you're, you're being invited to shape the moral character of your community. That's what it, is, what it is. That's what you're doing, right? Now, in doing that, and in understanding and, and, and going through that, that experience of being on a jury, a number of things happened. Um, and, and research has been done by this. I mean, Cheryl Thomas QC herself, even that's somebody within the system, but she has done research that shows, for example, that, that people who come out of a, um, a jury trial quite often uh, end up in a, in, with, with a, a, a much greater regard for the whole process and a more civic mindedness. Yeah. So it brings about a kind of alchemy yeah, in, in one's spirit and one's psychology and emotion as well. You realize the profound importance of it. You realize that justice is so important. And, and that reflection um, where, you know, within the case causes you to do a number of things. It causes it probably bring up all sorts of childhood traumas for yourself, maybe in a particularly important case. Um, it, it causes you to face your prejudices. It might show you, for example, where you're going into denial about things. All of these are sorts of things that, that start to cause the process of shadow work within yourself. It's, it's the promoter of the healing and the shadow work that's supposed to happen. So what we're talking about here is not just getting your liberties back. We're talking about setting you on the path of a healing process of profound importance. That's what placing trial by jury at the center of everything is really all about and why the universe wants us to do it and regards us as, as that being the most important thing of our community. Uh, you know, we've been talking for an hour now, Will, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm mindful of, of time, but I want to, you know, to, to come to, you know, to edge towards a conclusion that has, if possible, uh, some, uh, I suppose, some optimism. Sure. Because it's very challenging. I mean, I would, I would fully expect that anyone who's been listening to this for the first, who's coming across these concepts for the first time will be bamboozled and, and almost or possibly completely overwhelmed by, by a lot of what is being floated here it, because it, it's so profound. But it, it can, it can sound as though it's a, a hill too high to climb. You know, it can it can feel as though what what you're describing of of a population that's that's uh, uh, paying attention, each individual paying attention to his or her conscience, t- taking responsibility, uh, you know, taking responsibility for not just for themselves and for their family, but for the wider community. Right. How is there any realistic hope of getting towards a society that's remotely like that? Never sure. mind. Yeah, really I really like that. Totally. And, and, and I understand your question. And, and essentially, and, and this is where people and I think it's broadly why I think that that um, people in a, in a more sort of campaigning position and who are, who are kind of into the whole conspiracy thing tend to veer off and not touch it. They don't like it because what they're looking for is a quick fix. Um, and the quick fix doesn't exist. You know, this is not a short term. Uh, it, it might be a medium term, actually. It could be. But what this actually requires of us, because I remember I said that there were prerequisites and conditions that must be in place for a a community of broadly, you know, liberty that's based on on liberties. Um, And those conditions have to exist. So that means that there's a deep, profound change that's got to happen and a lot of reflection, a lot of self-reflection that's got to happen. And actually, we could do that. If a, if, a, if a number of people cared enough about this, and it, that's to go to the, the hidden eighth hermetic principle, which is the principle of care. You know, what do you care enough about in the world to put your will behind, right? These are, again, a little bit more from the occult here. Quite important, yeah? So the care principle, that's a good test for you. What do you care enough about in the world to put your will behind, right? So if people cared enough about this, they would be talking about these concepts all the time, all over social media, they'd be they'd be making comments underneath, um, you know, newspaper articles on on the web and 
putting in references to this, that, and the other, pointing people at articles uh, or at videos or interviews like this one, for example, or whatever it may be. This would become noisy in society because people become passionate about these topics, right? So you either do or you don't, right? And so what that ultimately means is that if you, the, the relatively dis, relative discomfort that you're going to have to face in going through that work and that shadow work process is going to be nothing compared with, I don't know, two years down the line, five years down the line, when society hits a cataclysmic point, maybe, I don't know, where you've, we've bent things so far away from reality that it's going to snap back painfully. Yeah. And that, I mean, Jordan Peterson puts it like that. He describes natural law like that, where you take the fabric of the universe and you bend it out of shape into a shape that it doesn't want to go ultimately. And you can do that to a certain extent for a length of time, but there's going to come a point where that's going to snap back at you regardless, whether you like it or not. And the longer that you leave a lie in place or a distortion of reality in place, the nastier it's going to be. So we have a choice, you know, and I don't like being the, the, <laughs> the bringer of that choice. Um, but it's better that we do it now and we get excited about these principles and we actually decide that we do want to heal ourselves and we want to evolve as human beings and become more conscious. Well, that's the way that you do it. You do it through self-reflection and through shadow work and you start calling out things and you start pointing at the Constitution and you start talking about, well, actually, what is this about courts of conscience? Why aren't we? Why is it that only one percent of cases are reaching uh, trial by jury. Why is that the case? Start asking these awkward questions of the establishment. Yeah, pin the politicians down and say, what is your authority? Where does it come from? What is this business about parliament being sovereign? Because it isn't under the constitution. Absolutely not. Um, because otherwise there's no limitations placed on you. You can do what you like. You can be a tyranny. How, how does that work? Mm -hmm. Right. Start having, now in order to do that, and to get familiar with these concepts and these arguments, you've just got to do the reading. You've got to have these conversations. And you're not always going to get it right either. But that's all right. So that's what, I, that's what I've done is put a website up called www.commonlawconstitution.org. And that focuses on this information about constitutional law in its true authentic form, in its proper form. So ask the awkward questions. Put in the pr provocative statements all over Twitter or Facebook. Start churning things up a bit and being a bit of a spanner in the works. And it won't take long. If we all do it, if we do it in large enough numbers it, and then self-reflect at the same time, you might be surprised how we could pull this around. Ask the awkward questions. Well, I think right. that's... That's key. I, I, I'm going to let you go on this on that on that note there, Will. But I would just I would just say to you and to and to and to everyone listening that I've only just embarked upon this. It's been a couple of years, and we'll put the link to your to your websites in this so that people can go and, and begin that that process. I've only just touched the outside edge. I've only just become aware that that this is is out there. To be to be comprehended, I have nowhere near properly comprehending it. But what I what I have experienced so far has genuinely been life changing. This has this has reset my clock. I've been I've begun to be realigned to to what I've begun to understand the universe wants of me, and and so for that and 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 to you, I'm extremely grateful. That you've that you've nudged me onto this onto this path, and I am I am following it and reading it as best I can. I'm absolutely delighted, and, and actually, Neil, I would say, and I'd say this and embarrass you in front of your viewers: <laughs> there aren't very many people actually that that can express this as as accurately and as well as you do. Actually, this is not a kind of mutual patting on the back exercise going on here, but it is true. You've got it really spot on, and what's interesting about that is that. That's the test of how well it's sunk, okay? So remember I was talking about thoughts, feelings, and actions, okay? The, the actions is the rhetoric part of us, which is the expression. And the, in through expressing ideas, it helps those ideas to sink ever deeper in understanding. And that's a really important process. So if you're not expressing them, 
if you're not getting them out there and practicing that expression of these ideas, then you're not actually kind of exercising it within yourself and sinking it down. And that's how I can tell that you really get it because you do express it very, very eloquently. So that's the sign of it. So people need to get out there and do that, definitely. Yeah. I, can, I, my, I always find my great inspiration, believe it or believe it not, is, you know, when, uh, when, when Socrates' friend went to the Oracle at Delphi and said, who's the wisest man in Athens and why? It was, the answer was Socrates only because he knew that he knew nothing. Right. <laughs> that, 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 that if you just accept yeah. that you don't know. Yeah. And that your only hope is to start asking questions. Yeah. Then you're, then you're on the road to somewhere. Right. You yeah. know, if, if you just if you just internalize the thought that I don't know anything, yes, but I'm determined to find something out, and yeah. my only means of doing that is by interrogating everyone around me and the universe. Quite then you're right. then you're on the way. 